program. Uh, uh, I'm Bob Cowden. I'm uh, an official in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, and uh, have had a uh, a very interesting career in, uh, in as a, a jumps official. So uh, I, I find this uh, format uh, a pretty exciting format where we we get to share. Uh, 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 four or five times a year with uh, jumps officials from across Canada. We have a very uh, interesting format for a program today. Uh, my good friend uh, Phil Martin from uh, Guelph, Ontario is going to be the presenter today. So just to put things in perspective, uh, Phil is a daily runner himself, so he really sets the, uh, the tone for what uh, 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 officials uh, should enter into our sport with. Uh, Phil's also a, a, a long-standing jumps official. He's the level four vertical jumps official in uh, Ontario. He resides in Guelph, Ontario. And just for uh, special interest, uh, Phil was uh, selected as the best official at the World Masters Outdoor Championship in Ampere, Finland. Uh, this summer. So without any further ado, welcome Phil Martin. We look forward to your program. The topic, uh, pole vault rules and subjectivity. Thank you very much, Bob. Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for joining tonight. Um, this this group, as, as Bob said, we, we are a, a, a national group. So even though uh, quite often we generally will officiate effectively the, the, with the same group of officials on a regular basis, or with, even with the same, uh, a lot of the same athletes on a regular basis, um, these discussion groups give us, give us a, a good chance to, to compare um, notes, if you like, from, from our different regions, from our different provinces, and uh, ultimately work towards best practices and uh, consistency um, on the occasions when we do get together at national championships or into province, uh, out of province meets, um, we quite often make the observation along the lines of, well, that's not how we do it in Ontario, or, well, that's interesting how you do it in Quebec, you know, it, so, and also when we speak to, um, uh, to coaches or to athletes, we will get observations along the lines of, well, that's not how the officials uh, made that call last week, last month at this meet. So I guess um, in a long-winded way, I'm just trying to say, let's um, have that as the scope of our discussion tonight. Let's, let's look to come out of this with a common viewpoint and uh, an understanding of what our best practice is with some of the aspects of officiating pole vault that involve a certain amount of subjectivity. And uh, can I advance these slides, Eric, or do I have to have you do that? I'm not sure. Eric, if you can uh, advance, please. So yeah, we're gonna um, we're gonna look at specifically just pole wall. And I know this is a jumps group. We're not going to talk about horizontal jumps or high jump at all. We're just going to look at some uh, very specific things that only really apply to pole wall, or in the circumstances that I'm going to introduce tonight, they only really apply to pole wall. And if we want to put some labels on them, these are subjective rulings that involve the environment, equipment, and action of the athlete. Next slide, please. So the first of these, environment. We have a scenario. The athlete vaults and clears the crossbar. After release, the athlete's pole falls toward the crossbar or the uprights, and the crossbar is knocked off. So as the judge in this circumstance, are we raising a red flag or are we raising a white flag? And what, if anything, needs to be considered before we make the call? 
So what I've neglected to, to mention there in the scenario is this is, is outdoors. And perhaps there's a bit of a windy day involved. Mm -hmm. Did he make an attempt? So, and, and that, yeah, you're exactly right. Is that Tim? Yep. <laughs> so you're, you're exactly right, Tim. Yeah, it's, it's, these are the things. So what is it, you know, as officials, what are we considering? How does the rule book help us? What is, is the scope of our decision-making here? How windy was it? Did he make an attempt to just uh, <laughs> throw the uh, pole back? And how do we, how would we determine that, Tim? How would we determine whether the athlete is making an attempt to throw the pole back. Visual by the by the ref, referee by the official at the bar. Okay, and if if we go to the next slide, please, Eric. So in in the rule book, one of the things it tells us for an outdoor event is we should have uh, one or more wind socks, and I've highlighted the the phrase there to show the athletes the approximate direction and strength of the wind. What I'm gonna suggest is that as an official, we should be paying attention to this too. We should be able to firstly determine is, um, you know, is the wind a factor? Is the direction of the wind a factor and its severity? And also as an official, are we in a good position to make this call? Um, I find that unless you're stood looking across the plane of the crossbar or close to looking across the plane of the crossbar, it's very difficult to judge, or it's more, it's much more difficult to judge whether the athlete has made um, a deliberate effort to release the pole away from the crossbar and then to determine whether the wind has had any effect on changing the direction of that pole. So if we go digging in the rule book, we have uh, under 2610 extraneous forces. When it is clear that the bar has been displaced by a force not associated with an athlete, and they use the example, e.g. a gust of wind, but they're, they're not mentioning a pole here. They're just mentioning the wind itself. Um, so on a really windy day, um, we may, you know, some of us will have experienced having to hold the crossbar in place until such time as the athlete is making their attempt, um, either with <laughs> physical means or with various uh, cords or strings or whatever, and then allowing the athlete to make the vault without any uh, retention of the crossbar. Okay, yeah, any comments, questions before we move on? So she's putting together care packages for the children. She's already delivered food and water. I guess there's another question. There's someone's TV in the background. <laughs> Okay, Eric, let's uh, let's move on if there's no more comments on that one. Um, we also, we have a situation where the athlete vaults and clears the crossbar. After release, the athlete's pole falls against the crossbar without displacing it or without immediately displacing the crossbar. So the crossbar is still in place, but the athlete's pole is up against the crossbar, perhaps still in motion. Um, so my question is, at what point can the official determine whether this attempt is, is finished and is it a good attempt and therefore a white flag or is it a failed attempt and a red flag? What considerations do we need to make before raising the flag? Anyone <laughs> have any observations on this one? Are we letting the athlete remove the pole from the crossbar? Well, that's a very good question, John. But um, at what point would the athlete be permitted to do that? When the white flag goes up, 
after Very the good. flag race. Yeah. We actually had a Canada Summer Games uh, just a few weeks ago in the same events, the, the men's decathlon pole vault. We had, within the space of 15 minutes, we had two very similar attempts. The first attempt, the, the guy cleared the crossbar and was up on his feet very quickly and grabbed his pole just as it impacted the uh, crossbar. And I had the flags. I immediately put up a red flag because I hadn't been able to establish that the crossbar was not going to fall. And he grabbed his uh, he grabbed his pole. He was given a red flag, and I also mentioned to him why he was given the red flag. And then within fifteen minutes, a very similar occurrence, different athlete. He was much slower getting up. His pole had, by this time had come to rest against the crossbar. And I was just, uh, I just raised the white flag as he jumped up and grabbed his pole. Um, I'm sure to the, the spectators watching, they were questioning, well, why did one athlete receive a white flag and one a red flag? Um, I don't know, is, is Pritam, are you on this call? Pritam, Pritam was, uh, was with me at this event. And after the first one, he kind of gave me he kind of gave me a thumbs up and a nod. Yes, I agree with you, Cole. There, and the second one, I got more of a uh, okay. Well, you're in charge, kind of a, a look from from pretem. I'm sure he would remember that one. But yeah, it's um, and and again, it, this reinforces the fact that as judges, we should always try and have uh, the flags um, because otherwise, you know, at what point is is the decision made? Um, the rule book does give us the opportunity to reverse decisions. Um, but I mean, it's, it's unclear to the athlete um, if he has not received the white flag at what point he's able to retrieve his ball. Um, any other comments, questions? I, I guess the comment that I would have, Phil, can you yeah. hear me? Yes, go ahead, Bob. The comment, the comment that, that I would have is you raise um, a point for me that it should be the chief that has the flags in pole vault and it should be the chief then that is making that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Mm -hmm. And uh, Eric, if you can uh, advance to the next slide, please. We can uh, we can see where in the in the rules it it gives us some guidance. So the actual rule reads: after the release of the pole, no one, including the athlete, shall be allowed to touch the pole unless it is falling away from the bar or uprights. If it is touched, however, and the referee, so we he, the referee here is specified, not the chief judge, is of the opinion that but for the intervention. The bar would have been knocked off. The vault shall be recorded as a failure. Okay, so we can move on to a different area. Uh, equipment. I think we've all seen this scenario. An athlete vaults and at some point during the vault, one or both of the standards kind of gives way and falls down and the crossbar um comes off either you know either just because the equipment failed or was it because the athlete knocked the crossbar off um but it presents another quandary to the officials what happens next and and this comes back to one of my earlier uh, points of guidance that i was encouraging this group at the start is you know how do we be consistent we might be consistent at the same venue in Ontario or the same venue in Quebec, but how do we be consistent as a group of Canadian gyms officials from meet to meet, from venue to venue? Route 6102. If, if there was equipment failure, no flag should be going up. A replacement trial should be given immediately. Immediately, yes. Yeah. So I'm sorry, and your name, sir? 
Oh, uh, it's Bing. Bing? Bing, if, if it was clear that the equipment failed at the time the athlete came down pretty heavy on the crossbar, would you still make the same call? If the equipment fail at the same time as he land on the pole, on the on the crossbar, yeah. If there's a pretty heavy uh, impact with the crossbar by the athlete, and the equipment if, fails, if the equipment fails, is caused by the athlete, mm -hmm. the red flag will go up. Okay. But if the equipment failure is not caused by the action of the athlete, no flag should be going up. No flag. Okay. Uh, maybe we should rethink that a little because by the equipment failure, did that allow sufficient time for hypothetically the bar to return to the pigs and stay? Mm, so perhaps. had the equipment not failed and the athlete had brushed the bar and the, and the bar, crossbar returned to the pigs, we would call that a fair vault. But in this case that you're saying, and I'm just adding in this little obscure situation, oh, yeah. you know, uh, the athlete doesn't have the opportunity of the bar returning to the pigs, the potential of the bar returning and sitting on the pigs. Yep. And it, it, there could be an occasion when the athlete has cleared the bar, you know, considerably, and there's, there's no question that there was any impact of the athlete on the crossbar, yeah, the equipment could fail. It's just, we, I think we've all seen that one too. Mm -hmm. Phil, Phil, Phil. So this, is a, this is a tricky one. I, I think, sorry, Pritam, I'll let you in in one second. Yes. I think this is also, it, it underlines the fact that we have to watch all aspects of all vaults all the time. We can't kind of just be uh, daydreaming a little bit and, and think, oh, did he clear that? Did he touch that? What happened there? It's very difficult to maintain that focus for, for two, three, or sometimes longer hours, every single moment. Go ahead, Peter. So I have a question for you, Phil, uh, based on yeah. the, the, the event and the situation you're speaking about. Say, for example, it had been determined that it was in really an equipment issue, not mm -hmm. uh, it was not the athlete that caused anything, and that you decided that to give a replacement trial at that time do you allow extra time for the athlete? How much of time would you give to the athlete? So that, because right now he needs to get prepared, ready to, to, to take his trial, right? So yes. what is it about yes. time limit and what, how are you going to do to, to, to work on that one? Well, let's, let's put up the next uh, slide, please, Eric, because I've, uh, I've used my crystal ball and I've foreseen this very question. So the rule book tells us that re replacement trials, if for any reason beyond the control, an athlete, oh, I can't read it because I've got my home photograph in there. <laughs> an athlete is hampered in a trial and is un unable to take it, or the trial cannot be correctly recorded. So we could argue that, um, you know, if there's an equipment failure, you cannot correctly record that trial. The referee shall have the authority to award them a replacement trial or under any circumstances that a replacement trial is awarded. Um, the rule book tells us quite clearly, no change in the order shall be permitted. But it also tells us a reasonable time shall be allowed for any replacement trial, according to the particular circumstances of the case. So we have to use our, our judgment, uh, but we should maintain the order um, and that no change in the order shall be permitted because because quite often we'll hear um, Coaches, if they're close by, they'll be uh, basically telling us, oh, so you can put them at the end of the round then, can you? Well, actually, no, we'll, uh, we'll give them time to prepare, but they, they need to take their replacement trial right away. So does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Very good topic, Phil. Very good topic. Mm -hmm. And there is a, another similar one. The next slide, please, Eric. Uh, I think we've all, um, unfortunately, I think we've all unfortunately witnessed uh, this scenario. Uh, the athlete vaults, and during the vault, the athlete's pole breaks. Um, again, 
Is it a red flag? Is it a white flag? Is there a replacement trial? What needs to be considered? Um, this one is, is less subjective. The rule book clearly states that the athlete will be awarded a replacement trial. Um, I guess at this point where the complication is that there is a good chance that the athlete may have injured themselves. Or there is some debris that we need to clean up to ensure that the, uh, the runway and the pit is safe for the next jump. So there are those uh, complications, um, but the rule book does uh, tell us that the athlete will be awarded a replacement trial. And as we've just seen, that replacement trial should be taken uh, immediately after a suitable um, time period. And we've had a, a couple of uh, fairly high profile instances this summer with uh, athletes Holes breaking, or if not this summer at the uh, Olympics and then at um, World Championships, I guess. Phil, may I raise a boy a bit higher for you? Please. So, say for that in this situation, the athlete's uh, pole is uh, broke and he, he does not have any other pole personal pole for himself oh. and he want to i don't know to us and as an athlete to have a pole or whatever and basically the athlete is also can also refuse because that's personal right you can say no what what would be your call he don't have any pole and nobody want to lend him a pole gorilla glue <laughs> <laughs> and he's time out yeah. The athlete retires. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that would be the only option, I think. Because uh, other athletes, I, I imagine other athletes would be willing to to give a poll. That's my experience from uh, pole vault athletes, um, but they're not obligated to do so, obviously. Yeah. And they may not have a pole the right length or weight. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It is, uh, it is interesting. We never know what's going to happen next. Uh, moving on, Eric, please. So that's just the uh, the rule book reference regarding the broken pole. Shall be awarded a replacement trial. And the next one, please. Oh, this is our little video. So this comes under the heading now, athlete action. Oh. Please work. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you all to uh, take a look at this video. We will probably play it more than once, but we're looking for um, if you're the judge and you have the flags, are you raising a red flag or a white flag after this one? If we can. Uh... This one right there. There we go. So this is from a Vasti meet in Windsor, Ontario. Didn't see much wrong with that. <laughs> so the gentleman in the foreground is applauding. That's the athlete's coach. Watch your hands. So she clips the bar with her thighs. That's a nice freeze frame. Have you seen anything wrong there? Yeah. She's holding the pot, but I can't. Did she oh, hold, yeah. hold it or did she accidentally touch it? Exactly. <laughs> and we have the option of freeze frame as an official. We At the meet, we don't. So I would assume that the athlete did mm -hmm. not try to vault the bar. Right. And you mentioned in, uh, something that John vaults. Um, that's way before my time. I know you and uh, many other officials on this call tonight have, have were 
around when that active, happened? Active when uh, this very rule that we're about to discuss came into force because certain athletes had, had um, perfected the art of being able to replace the bar if they hit it while they jumped. So that was that's a real video from a real event, and the the athlete made the ball, and everybody other than uh, one person, it would seem, decided that it was a good vault. And then um, another team's coach objected. And <laughs> as I understand it, I was not at the event, but as I understand it, the, uh, the decision was reversed and it, it was deemed a fault <laughs> for this very rule that we're looking at now. An athlete fails if during the vault, they steady or replace the bar with their hand or hands. And earlier this year, I was officiating at U Sports in New Brunswick. And I was quite happily going along and um, officiating this event. And then I was notified that more than one coach, well, one in particular, but more than one coach was getting pretty agitated and claiming that for a second time, a, a certain athlete had done this very same thing and steadied or replaced the bar with their hands. So I did what all good uh, chief judges would do and uh, invited my referee to take care of the complaint. <laughs> Is Chris Allward on the call? Chris, are you uh, on the call tonight? Maybe not. Chris was my referee that day, and uh, so I, I um, so I, Phil, my question would be, was there any video? Not that was offered as um, evidence, no. I'm sure there was video. <laughs> every every single vault, every single pole vault competition has at least one video in my experience. But yeah, no, they, it didn't get that far, but they were quite um, vociferous. And that actually was the catalyst for this discussion tonight. I, it made me think, um, I would love to be able to, to learn more about this um, black art, this mystical <laughs> uh, rule, if you like. Has anybody on this call tonight, anybody, any of us ever had to make that call? Yes. <clears throat> Is that John? Yes, it was me. John, when, when did you make this call and what were the circumstances? It was with uh, one of the, the athletes from my club. Um, and uh, he had been learning this stuff down in the States because it still wasn't illegal. Oh, okay. Um, and um, it was very obvious that he was reaching to steady the bar. Yep. I've seen where the athlete clears and their hand touches the bar, but they didn't intentionally reach for the bar. They didn't intentionally take their hand away from the bar. It was just their hand placement during the flight of the athlete. Yep. And I wouldn't call a fault on that sort of thing, but I would call it where the person does reach to se steady the bar. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been doing quite an extensive search, looking for videos and just watching competitions, you know, vault after vault after vault, just, just seeing how different athletes go over the bar. You know, some are like fling their arms well out the way others will pull out their hands you know almost in front of their chest like in a, a instinctive protecting themselves kind of manner almost yeah it's a very difficult call and as well as not having made that call myself i've never been at an event where another official has has made that call so it sounds like it's not uh, an every week kind of thing If at all. Yeah. Anybody else any experience of, of, of being challenged by coaches, perhaps? You know, why are you not making this call? Well, uh, Phil, uh, I had the opportunity of having this type of calls, but not here. It was mostly in African region. 
it was for yeah. African Championship. But the the position I, I was uh, looking at the vault, I was in a clear position to see the action. I was the one who witnessed it, and nobody yeah. was even uh, challenged that call. Uh -huh. So it, I, I saw it for myself. So I was in a good position to see the action itself. And the other official with me working, they saw the action. So there was no like, okay, no, no complaint, nothing. Every the athlete uh, sees him, uh, recognize that he did it. Yes. Yeah. So it was, a, it was for me, it was an easy call because the athlete recognized that he did it. But if the athlete at a point of time, then we would ask or whatever. But the other official was also here. They saw everything and it was okay. It was a good call for that one. Yeah. So it is, when the athlete knows they're doing it is, it, is it quite obvious, do you think? Or is it still well, very difficult to call? Well, the athlete knows. So they, 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 they just look at the, the flag that was red and they yeah. just knock their, they just uh, shake their head. Okay, <laughs> okay, it was uh, okay. I know it, so yeah. it was yeah. obvious that they are not going even to complain. Yeah. Okay. And where would you say was a, is the the best position for the official to make that call? The best one would be is the, the one looking at the vertical plane. Do we be yeah. in a in a good position to see exactly where the athlete was, what is what is his action with that? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of the same place for looking to see that the athlete is releasing the pole away from yes, yes, the cross. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's an excellent point. The positioning of the chief judge is critical and it need, the chief judge needs to be in a spot for, to observe the total jump, mm. the total vault. Yeah. I would agree, Bob. And uh, even to, to underscore that some more, the chief judge needs to be able to reach agreement with it, the members of his team or her team, what the roles and responsibilities are gonna be based on where they're positioned, who is looking for what, and using six eyes to make a call rather than two eyes if needed. Again, Phil, I it's a very, very good point. And, you know, do we thoroughly cover the roles and responsibilities of each position at the start of a meet for our team? Mm -hmm. So the team meeting and the sharing of information, critical factor in best practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah I mean, what I'm going away with here today is the positioning of the chief judge for visibility to be able to make a valid call is critical. Not only that, true, but I would also add is whenever such a situation occurs, the way the team react to, we should not be like, okay, oh, no, no, this happened or it's something like a, a something that, okay, everyone try to react it differently. It needs to be, we were working like a team, be yeah. the chief, be the other people. So it's going to be like, okay, we need to seem to be like professional. So the way we handle this type of situation, we should not be in taking a, a rush decision or whatever. No. We can no. just consult with your colleagues and everything. The decision is taken. This is okay. All clear. Let's go for that one. Yep. It might just be a nod of the head or a thumbs up. Yep. It's good. I, I did I did have some fun doing a YouTube search uh, looking at uh, the rule 28.2.3. After leaving the ground, they place their lower hand above the upper one or move the upper hand higher on the pole. There's a very, there's a very interesting sport in Europe where they bolt across canals. And uh, the, the very action they do is they, they jump onto a, a pole that's kind of stationary, stuck in the mud at the side of the canal. And then they climb up as fast as they can as the pole is falling towards the other bank so they can clear the canal. Right. They were the, the humorous videos that I had for 28.2.3, but I couldn't see any uh, examples of that on a pole vault runway, unfortunately. Uh, you you, have, I, to, you a, have to. Can I make sure, a comment on that? Oh, uh, sorry. Go ahead, Bing. And Bing, then Bing, John. Uh, this, this rule was probably in place way back when this aluminum pole uh, or, or steel pole where it does not bend. 
mm -hmm. right now the fiberglass pole when you're bending you there's no option for you to move your lower hand above the higher hand no but but in the solid pole yes you could do that so this rail has become obsolete because of the advances in the pole technology uh, uh yes uh, probably it's true because i have done that with solid poles yeah yeah able to climb up the pole on the pole vault <laughs> mm. and uh john you had a comment i was going to say the same thing i can remember yeah. my grade eight uh teacher showing us how to do the climbing up the pole <laughs> he, he he had uh, competed in 56 yep wow well i'm i'm uh, quite clearly i'm still the rookie of the group here I, you know I'm, I'm still in single digits and in, in years of experience around uh pole ball and jumps um but how, however many years you've you've been at this it's it's still you you know you don't know what you don't know and uh, we can all benefit from from shared experiences from best practices from these kind of discussion groups these are these are really valuable phil i, I wonder if you could uh, if you could mention the crossbar uh that sat on top of the apparatus uh, <laughs> this summer. We had that again at um, Legions. I was I was wanted to get my camera out and take a picture, but before I could, it, it had been fixed. Um, so what Bob is describing is um, an athlete will vault and they'll have a fairly substantial impact with the crossbar, but it will kind of bounce in place on the pegs. But then it will um kind of project itself up so that it comes down on top of the standard on top of the upright not it doesn't remain on the original peg it, it sits on the top of of the equipment lavalies so, i was going to say lavalies indoor world record that never was that you should still be able to get that on the internet yes 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 um, some of the equipment now is designed, or I think in the rule book, it shows that it needs to be designed so that this is not possible. But of course, there's a lot of equipment around that is not designed in, in such a way. Um, and it, it just has, you know, a flat platform, if you like, that allows the crossbar to come to rest on the top. But yeah, it's, it's quite a rare occurrence, Bob, but we did have exactly the same thing happened um, in one of the pole vaults at the um, national league in Shabrook this summer. Um, I think it's a point worth the worth the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 then again, you know, as an official, fall is uh, it's a fault, um, and it does actually say that in the rule book that it needs to re remain on the peg, and it needs to remain on the peg. That it started on. So if the crossbar is displaced from an upper peg onto a lower peg or a lower peg onto an upper peg, then that again would be would be a fault. Phil, yep. Phil, what you Hello. just said, it, it stayed on the peg, but it just turned, not on the on the side it was. It's still on the peg, right? It did not fail. It not so In technically it's it just twisted, yes? No, no, so it's In not legions. Anymore. One side landed on the top of the upright. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and it stays on the same peg even if the crossbar flips upside down. That that is a good jump. Yeah. It's a very lucky jump, but it's it's a, it's a good jump. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very lucky jump. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. again, I I think uh, the situation that I went into it really reinforced me that as the chief judge or referee that you need to take a look at the equipment you're working with like an equipment inspection before yep. you start mm -hmm. yeah we get complacent if we if we're at the same venue with the same equipment all the time we 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 kind of know our equipment like we know our own vehicle but then when you go to another venue different equipment 
you need to, yes, you need to get that intimate knowledge pretty quickly. Great. Yeah. Well, I think that was the last slide, uh, was it not, uh, Eric? I, I believe so. Oh yeah, just a celebration. So maybe, there. Phil, we could open it up uh, if there's anything in relation to pole vault that uh, uh, maybe a sharing session uh, at this particular point. We've got about five minutes here. Uh, May I have a question? Yes. So say, for example, uh, we are in a rainy, rainy day outside, pole vaulting. And so one of the athletes uh, realized that his pole need to be taped. And he come to the chief judge Hey, you know what? Because based on safety, my hand is slipping on that. Can I tape my pole? And he's he's the only one jumping and all that. So do what is the arrangement we are going to make so that for the time factor or for security should be allowed? Should we give him extra time? Because it's raining and safety wise, he might hurt himself. So I open the question to all guys. Of a extension on that, how many people have done uh, pole inspections to check the layers of tape on the pole? Yeah. Well, I do. I, I incorporate that as a part of a regular thing now. It was Bob. I don't know if you were officiating with me in um, in Tampa Day, but there was. One of the older gentlemen had his poll. Um, my, Michael Soralta invited him to, to retape his poll. He had these um, multiple ridges on his poll that were probably, probably like a quarter of an inch or more deep ridges where he just, <laughs> he just wrapped tape around and around and around in these donuts. They'll play on poll inspection. Yeah, yeah. Used to know. hate doing... Sorry, John. I said I used to hate having to do pole inspection as the tech manager. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. It's something I have very little experience with. I made, I made a point at Canada Summer Games. I had a few minutes and uh, Barkley Frost was there with me. I, uh, I asked Barkley to give me a bit of a tuition on what I should be looking for. So we can, uh, yeah, for sure, we can all learn from each other. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I have a question. Whose responsibility is that? To send the chief or the ref? It's always the referees. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's the chief's responsibility to notice these things and then it's the referees responsibility to give out the discipline that's well, another way of looking at it yeah maybe an alert referee uh, determines whether or not a chief has uh, got too many tasks at, at hand and can assist yes <laughs> yeah yeah you can also inspect the polls during the event i do that quite often yeah as a referee interesting point yeah, I, I did that in Langley this, uh, this summer as well, too, when the pole were on the pole stand. I went around and uh, looked at each of those poles. I just usually go down and stand where the on the uh, on deck vaulter is, and I'll just say, can I see your pole, please? Mm -hmm. What? what? <laughs> yeah, I won't see your pole. No problem. And then I check it off on a sheet. So okay, I, I have one scenario that I would like to present it to the group. I don't know if anyone's had ever come across this before. I don't have any video or picture to show that. Mm -hmm. This usually occur on a young, uh, new beginner type of pole vaulters. Uh, they're using pole that are much higher than uh, the, the bars is. Uh, a vaulter running down the runway clear the bar, but taking the pole over the bar with them. <laughs> Has anyone seen this before? Oh, yes. 
yes. Oh, yes. 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 Yes, mostly with beginners. And oh, two meter vaulters. Masters, right. I, I, I find no rule on the WA book that say that is not allowed. That's not a good vote at all because he never released the poll. He still mm -hmm. has the poll with him. And he, caused, he cleared the bar and without knocking it over. So okay. the only place you're going to find the word release is 28.4. And it says after the release of the poll, that is the only place you will find that word used. Yeah. yeah. I had an 80 year old woman in Kamloops who uh, cleared the bar at 136 and still had the pole in her hand when she stood on the, on the mat and then she threw it away. Yeah. So I said, that's a good jump. She's going to have that kind of ingenuity. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is a difficult one. I had a gentleman uh, from Slovakia this year intentionally clear the bar at a low height and took his pole with him over the crossbar. <laughs> <laughs> that was strictly a challenge of the chief judge to see what the chief judge would do. The chief judge, being me, <laughs> faulted him. What, what did you say, Bob? I faulted him. And the rationale? He didn't like, he didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, what route did you use to fault to him? I was, um, the chief. I was the chief. I was the chief. It's my event, and it's a fault. <laughs> uh, the uh, technical delegate uh, uh, in World Masters is adamant that any athlete, any master athlete, because master athletes are where I've run into this in the past, that the height is so low that, as was related in, in uh, Tim's story, you know, the, the athlete will still be in, in possession of the pole uh, when they cross the crossbar and land on the mat. And yeah. the technical delegate uh, from uh, Puerto Rico is adamant that, um, it, that in, in Masters Athletic Championships, that is a fault. And again, if you read the book or the rule book, you will find no place where it talks about release. But if the pole is not released, then one would say the pole was an advantage to the athlete. The, there was no attempt at throwing the pole to get rid of the pole. So one could say uh, the pole, the athlete's pole, could then have been an assist to them. So that was technically uh, why I used a red flag in that particular case. Uh, in, the, in the particular case, I also have, ex have had past experience with the gentleman, and I know exactly what he was doing. Low height, and he was just testing out to see who the chief judge was. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, there's no, absolutely no question about that. That was one of probably four things he did until he actually started vaulting properly. What would happen if the jumper goes over and leaves their pole on the other side and doesn't bring it over with them, but actually still has the pole in their hands when they land on the mat? Then I would go back to the word 24-8 release. There's mm -hmm. no release. I know that's generally the case with the masters athletes. They'll they'll be they'll have two feet planted on the, the landing area mm -hmm. and the pole will effectively still be sitting in the box. Then you throw it away. Yeah, they, then that happens, Tim. They'll just throw it back towards the runway and then they'll get a white flag and then they'll reach out and go again. Yep. A very interesting, very interesting discussion point. Phil and I have had this on a number of occasions. Mm. I'm sure many others have been through the release of the, the uh, poll too. But it is, it is nice if we can find someone in the rule book that supports our decision making, but in this case, we're not going to find it. <laughs> So what would your, your decision be if they don't bring the pole over with them, but it still is in their hand when their feet touch the mat? 
they need to release the pole. Okay. Yes. But after they touch the mat, it, would that be acceptable? Just about. It's borderline, but yes. If okay. if there is some kind of if it's part of a same fluid motion, one motion, it's part of you know the end of the vault is to throw the pole away. Yes, then they'll get credit for that. Likewise. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because sometimes they'll stand there and they'll be looking at you like, well, what do we do next? <laughs> 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 They've forgotten. Yeah. yeah. Fun and games. Fun and games. Fun and games. And so is there any any other uh, situation sharing, especially from this year, that uh, anyone has that would be of interest to all of us or a benefit mm -hmm. to all of us? I, I guess the, the only other thing that I have, which... Um, uh, Louise Busca uh, had a slide in her presentation, and, and her slide um, was of uh, a picture of five different tapes for measuring. Oh, yes. And that has, that's been an item that um, I've, uh, ha has had an impact on me. Um, especially well, as a chief judge or as a referee, and that is ensuring that we check tapes and we check measuring. Because as we all know, tapes and measuring sticks come in all shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. And really it is of benefit to number one, ensure that the official that is entering a horizontal pit is using the zero point on the tape. <laughs> and that in measuring sticks, that we check that the measuring stick is accurate. Uh, in in uh, Canada, there's many of us that are using uh, the yellow measuring stick. And the original yellow measuring stick had two pin placements, uh, one standard and one metric. Yeah. And often, uh, the standard or the American measure, because the stick is made in the US, uh, was used as opposed to the metric side. So again, I just go back to Louise's slides, slide, that one slide, five different examples of tapes with different zero points. So mm. that, that one, that, uh, uh, that I think that was in April that uh, Louise did that, and uh, that definitely has had an impact on me. And I've definitely started checking <laughs> measuring devices. So, Bob, I saw the one with the metric and versus the uh, imperial one, and I just put a piece of tape over it so you can't put the peg on the wrong side. Smart move. Yeah. Smart, yeah. smart, smart move. Because it happened many times. Yes. Yep. Oh, the early sticks were made that way. So the, uh, the, the early initial sticks were made that way with two different. Yep. Okay. Well, that's, uh, I mean, we're at um, uh, 5.50 now. So uh, Phil, I, I just want to say, I sincerely appreciate the, um, the slides that you shared with us today, the uh, thought that you put into your presentation. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, I know for me, it, uh, it uh, raises my curiosity and, and reminds me that I need to check closely on a whole number <laughs> of things. Uh, again, it reinforces to me the need for officials to be attentive to the job at hand and, uh, yeah, and positioning and teamwork. Yes. Yep. That's how it works. So I, again, I want to thank you. Uh, much appreciated. My pleasure. I am uh, looking for... Uh, someone to do a similar presentation, possibly in the horizontal jumps. Um, the next time we meet, which I don't have a date, I'll try and keep it in tune with the last time we met. So um, anyone in Victoria that might be interested in doing something on horizontal? <laughs> I see the shake of the head. <laughs> Well, hey, well I'll, I'll talk to Aileen on next week at the BC Senior Games. She can do it. She's okay. Good it. It, would, it would be good to again look at some situational problem solving. And, and you know, I think as as Phil did today, you know, maybe four situations 
uh, is sufficient uh, to get a, a, a thought process going. Yeah. Okay, I'll talk to her next week. We have the BC Senior Games.